All right. Well, let's go to work. Thank you. Uh, by the way, in case we haven't been introduced, my name is Steve Schleter, and uh, uh, I'm the uh, I'm bold coach. I'm uh, one of the coaches uh, with Tammy Youngs on never ending referrals. Um, prior to Keller Williams, I was one of the top 20 REMAX agents in the state of Texas. Uh, and by the way, I started my, my career in an extreme shifting market. And what we're going to go through today in terms of getting the right price every time was something that I developed to help the consumer better absorb the philosophy of how to get the right price and how to get the right price that was going to get them where they desired to go. And as part of our never ending referrals uh, system and our group, one of the things that we do is we provide not just you know the referral systems, the database systems, but what are the things to navigate the market of the moment right now, the things that are going on uh, in the world that you and I have to deal with. And one of them is getting sellers right on the price. And so that's where we're going to go today. And I'd love to hear from you guys um, before we get into this, you know, when we think about shifty market, we know that some of the biggest shifts that we're dealing with are industry shifts. Um, there's a consumer shift where the consumer's confused about what the heck is really going on in the real estate industry. And by the way, we've been having some network trouble. If I'm coming through a little blurry or fuzzy, it's probably not your end. It's probably mine. We've got some internet issues. I'm camped on a on a Bluetooth right now. So uh, bear with me if something goes wonky, I'll get right back on and, and do whatever we need to do. Uh, but all that said, here, I want you to put in the chat. I want you to tell me the direction and, and listen carefully before you answer. The direction of your market, is it still, is it, you know, if, if it's extremely low inventory, still multiple offers on most, I want you to put hot in the chat. If it's, Still low inventory, and yet it's softening a little bit. I want you to put um, just softening. And then if it's really you're gaining lots of inventory, maybe you're now up to two, three months, four months of inventory, uh, I want you to put soft market. So is it a hot market? Is it slightly trending towards softer? Or is it truly a soft market? Let's see what we've got out there. I want to see what the trend is. So go, wow, okay. Maybe a more softening than I thought out there. Oh, we're in the right place for the right conversation. Really depends on price range, says Haley. Construction still strong. Andre got it. Pretty firm still. <laughs> Marie, all of the above. That that's a little crazy for an agent. So of course, you know, little parts of the market, um, often driven by price range, maybe demand. Uh, and competition in certain parts of the market. So seems a lot of price range. Um, right, okay, gotcha. All right, so we've got more soft and more softening than we do hot, and yet I'm gonna cover both conversations. And um, this, this conversation helped me dramatically when it, it, I entered, when I entered my real estate career, real estate prices in Austin, Austin was in a massive shift and real estate prices were dropping a percent and a half a month. In fact, from the year I started my career to four years later, um, prices had dropped about 32 percent. Uh, and so it was it was a chasing market. A lot of people were chasing values down. Now, I don't see any of those kind of extremes in most of our markets, and yet it could feel that way. And, you know, there's the things that we hear out there right now, like, well, I know it's priced right, but it's, and it's not selling. And we're going to do a little bit of a reality check on, on some of these things today uh, so that we can do a better job of, of, of getting it right from the beginning. So I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint and let's get into this right now. Now, by the way, this is actually, these slides came from a presentation I did uh, at um, Family Reunion back, this you'll see this was from, whoops, it wants to automatically go. That's interesting. Okay, let's see if we can stop that from doing that. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, from Family Reunion 2017, and 
as we look at this slide right here, we start off every, you know, pretty much every introductory session we do with never ending referrals is we start with this slide. And, and this really tells us everything about really how we have to show up for the consumer uh, to win the relationship with the consumer and then how we position ourselves with the consumer. Now, this comes from Harvard University. It's something called the Trust Triangle. And it was a study of leaders who had done a great job establishing great levels of trust with the people they led. And they said, what was it the foundation of that trust? The first thing was logic. And, and the logic point was this. Uh, people felt like they knew uh, that the leader, in this case, you, as the database leader, um, they knew you could do it. They knew your reasoning and judgment was sound. They knew that you understood the market. So you have to be the expert of things that are happening in your market and in your industry so you can convey certainty in a way that's understandable. And this is a really logic conversation that is going to help them maybe get out of the emotion a little bit of pricing. And then, of course, the empathy is, I believe you care about me and my success. Now, when you're going to get people to price right, maybe not where they wanted to price, you know, that it's important that they feel a trust level and a connection with you. So the empathy piece was they got to feel like you really care about what it is they want, not just selling a house. And then, of course, authenticity, they experience the real you. And this is something we talk about in never ending referrals constantly is how do I succeed being authentically me and, and not so much this conversation today. Uh, and yet we're going to tell you how this conversation becomes a very authentic, uh, simple conversation. But here's what happens. And we're going to talk about this today is pricing it right happens twice. First with you in terms of your mindset around pricing and then with the seller. And you've got to be able to convey to the seller your understanding about what pricing is. And by the way, this comes right out of shift tactic number seven uh, in the shift book. So if we think about a mega agent mindset on pricing, it's this. Your job is to get the home sold. They, they, didn't, they don't hire us as much as they want us to market the house and do all the things that are necessary to get it sold. They don't want to be on the market. They want to sell. And so our mindset is my job is to get the home sold. Number two, I'm the expert. And so I've got to go in with this absolute certainty and conviction of price and where the price should be. And I'm going to work with a range and it's going to suit and match their motivation. The 14 day mindset, make a note here. 14 day mindset, regardless of the market. My goal as a mega agent is to have that home under contract in 14 days or less. And by the way, in a softening market, we'll talk about this in a bit, time is not my friend. And so sooner is better. And in a hot market, if I've positioned it appropriately, well, I should get offers or multiple offers in the first two weeks uh, and have it truly attractive, maybe multiple offers creating an auction-like atmosphere. And the mega agent mindset is always this, it's always the price. It's it's an always the price mindset that if something needs to sell and it's not selling, you know, with the rare exception, I will say that there are two percenters and there are three percenters that are very unique properties that uh, have a, maybe a limited market appeal and you've got to find the right fit as well. Maybe they're five percenters. And yet in most cases, it's always the price. And that's the mindset of the mega agent. The no such thing as inventory mindset is that it's not about carrying lots of listings. It's continuing to manage those listings in a way that they get to under contract. And we're going to get into the best, the two best pricing opportunities. In fact, the two best proper pricing property opportunities, excuse me, are when you list it and your first price reduction if you have to make a reduction. And of course, we we intend to avoid the reductions. Now, many of you have probably seen this in the shift book. Um, these create a powerful conversation. I think they they illustrate very well uh, the tale of different markets. And, and so when you look at a seller's market, uh, everything pretty much is in the market. 
because we're kind of riding maybe a little white wave of price increase, not a lot of selection. And most things are in the market. And then you got a little bit of a fringe where people are out overreaching just too much. And well, they're out of the market compared to the comps or their condition is out of the market and is not attractive. And then as a market begins to soften, now some, a lot of you put in the chat, softening markets. Well, in a softening market, you're beginning to see a little more inventory. You're beginning to see some of yours stay on the market longer. And now there are maybe, um, you know, when we think about, um, maybe there's many homes that are out of the market and there are maybe 40% are in the market. And, you know, the condition demands are better. The staging demands are, are stronger and you've got to have it priced a little bit more aggressively. And then you have this market. And th this is probably a one, one that a lot of us are experiencing right now, where if, if you've got some of my markets, San Antonio and the Austin area, where we're getting four plus in months inventory, we have segments of the market that have now hit six months inventory. Well, you've got about a third are in the market. You've got about a third, they're completely out of the market. They're not priced well. Uh, they're not staged well. They're not conditioned well. Their photography stinks. And then you've got these that feel like they're in the market, and yet they keep being a bridesmaid and never a bride. They're getting showings here and there. And, you know, to you, they feel competitive and yet they just don't bring an offer. And they're kind of in that no man's land. You know, there, there are things that just the consumer is perceiving as a better value in the market. So that said, you know, and then of course, this would be the extreme buyer's market where, where many things are out of the market. Most of us don't have that today. And then of course, just appreciate the power that staging makes right now, you know, to bring your listings to life. Same, same setting, completely different look, you know, to these two homes, the power of staging when, you know, the online presence matters so much, um, big deal. All right, so here's what I'm going to walk you through. Um, before we jump in deeper, I'm going to take you through a little conversation. and Let me set this up for you. First, you're going to do the things that you've usually done with the seller in terms of preparing them to price the property. In this case, uh, I'm going to have gone through the comparables and I go through what's recently sold in their competing market. I look very carefully at the pendings, especially in a softening market, because that's the cusp of what's bringing an offer right now. So I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on what just secured an offer. And then, of course, and when I'm in a softening market, one of the most important comparisons I'm going to make is the active listings that we're competing against in our market. Now write this down. It's not the comparables in their neighborhood. It's not the pendings in their neighborhood. It's not the active listings in their neighborhood. It's the active listings, pending listings, and sold listings in their competing market. And let's define the difference, especially as you get softening and, and you're going, man, it feels really competitive in their neighborhood, well, the question is, are you looking beyond the neighborhood into the competing market? And every one of you, when you're out showing a buyer, it's not that often that they're saying, I'm only interested in one neighborhood. I'm interested in neighborhoods that have these features, these amenities, these schools, and that might be two neighborhoods, three neighborhoods, five neighborhoods within a certain price range. And I want you to think of that as your competing market. And so the question you're asking yourself before you go sit down with and do the, uh, the, the CMA is what's the competing market for this home? Where would somebody buying here today also be considering? And I've got to look very carefully at those comparisons uh, particularly the actives, because if I keep having people look at the home and they go buy something else somewhere else, 
they were finding a better value in my competing market. It was it was competing because we were head to head and they chose somewhere else. So what's going to happen after we've walked now, we've got the comparables, we've looked at the competing market. I'm going to go through the comparables with them. And I'll say, here are the solds. And basically, we've got a range of solds in homes like yours. And, you know, let's say in this example that we're using, uh, let's see, what do I have in the slide deck here? We'll use the, that example here. Hang on just a second. So we'll, we'll say that I'm using a price range of 260 to 320. So we'll, we'll say that I'm working with a price range of 260 to 320. And really it's 300 to 320. The 260 is a, a price that's a wholesale price that nobody would want to want to really accept. But let's just say we're in that 290, 320 range. And the comparables are supporting that. And the highest, highest that I can see that we're ringing out of the market is 320. And that one sold in absolute great condition with great terms, maybe had a couple of concessions. Uh, I want to take all that into consideration. Staged really well. And then yet I look at the at the customer at the competition and I'm going, what's the competition look like in terms of what we're comparing to? So I want to show to that seller those that have sold. And maybe I've established a range based on what is sold, let's say 290 to 320. And 290 is a low end. And then we're looking at the actives together. And let's say the act is really support. Maybe there's some real tough competition at 300 to 305 um, that I'm competing against. And so we're going to look at those active listings. Now, here's a pro tip. Write this down. This will help you get the, the, the competitive price simpler. They say that a picture is worth how many words, guys? Thousands of words, right? Picture's worth a thousand words. And thank you, Carol. And picture's worth a thousand words. And I'm going to tell you about my own experience. So I sold uh, a home I had in Round Rock, Texas. And I, I, I'm, I operate a couple of market centers in the Austin area. And I had a contest for some of the agents in my productivity coaching program. And I said, y'all are going to do some mock listing presentations and the top three, voted the top three, are going to get to come compete for my listing. And the one that won, and she secured my listing, and by the way, she sold it in just a matter of weeks. Um, here's the thing she did that so impressed me. As we sat down and we're going through the price, uh, she's going through the comparables. And as we get to looking at the competing listings, she pulls up a big iPad and she pops it up on the desk. And she said, let's take a look at the homes you'll be competing against. And she's scrolling through the pictures. And as she would go through the kitchen, how do you think this one compares with yours? And I'm making a mental evaluation of my house because, hey, come on, face it, we're judging machines, right? And now I'm getting a self-judgment. I'm going, oh, that's actually nicer than mine. They got nicer countertops. And it, it's a whole different experience than an agent saying, here were the amenities of this home that either sold or, in this case, the ones you're competing against. And then I looked at the flooring. I'm going, that's not nicer flooring than I had. Now, I got a little bit nicer backyard, but not that significant. They got a nice deck. And at the end of the day, my idea of where I competed was um, brought down to reality a little bit. In fact, I was willing to then price it lower than what she ultimately recommended. And by the way, her recommended price did get the job done. And yet I found myself in this willingness after she scrolled through those photos. Now, Here's what you may have to do today. You may have to take it a step further. So I may leave it at this point and say, now, having looked at these 
three most you know competitive properties that we're competing against. Those that have recently sold it, having looked at their amenities, you know, it looks like we're in a range from blank to blank. Where do you feel like we need to be competitive? And they maybe they say, well, can we try it up at the 320 to start anyway? You know, I'd really like to get the most money. So, well, we could. And yet, could I educate you a little bit on, on, well, what smart sellers do with regard to pricing their home? Can I educate you a little bit? And in this case, they will always say yes. And now, what I'm about to walk you through, you would actually do on a legal pad. And I call it uh, pricing with a talking pad. And you do it on a legal pad rather than on a PowerPoint like I'm going to show you. Um, because, well, in fact, let me just, rather than show you the PowerPoint, let me just use my document camera. So we'll just do this. And so I got my legal pad out. So can I educate you a little bit on pricing? And the reason you wouldn't do this um, on a PowerPoint is that that feels like selling. What we really want to do is educate. And so I said, well, Let's talk about what we're going to do to get your home sold. And by the way, the key thing to keep coming back to is what is their motivation? See, people aren't selling a house. They're solving a problem. You know, they want to move somewhere. And they, they need to get out of the house. And so we're solving a problem. And we want to keep going back to their motivation as we have this conversation. And so I draw this out on a legal pad. And as I draw this out, I say, well, you know, let's talk about this. Now, there's three prices for every home. There's premium. And by the way, I'm going to send you a slide deck uh, that has all this on it. And of course, you'll get this recording. There's premium. Is that reversed? Is the image reversed on y'all's end? No, you're good. Okay, you can read it. Okay, it's reversed on my end for whatever reason. Uh, so premium, there's market price, and then there's wholesale. So if we think about it, there's really three prices for every home. Now, what we noticed earlier is the trend based on things that we looked at looks like 320 is about the top end of the market based on where we where we were looking before. I can justify it. It's a bit of a reach. Uh, the market price, probably right around 300 would be really market range. We saw some comparisons at about like 305, 300, 295. And then by the way, if you needed an all cash offer to get out of here really fast, that's probably something like 260. Now let's talk about the things that influence where we decide to price your home tonight. And the first thing that we have to think about in terms of moving you to Florida is what's the trend in the market right now? And we've got to talk about your risk tolerance. And then the other thing we're going to talk about is, you know, what's the condition of the property and how much time do we have to get the job done? So these are things that would influence where in this, well, in this spectrum we decide to price. Now, if we think about trend, you, you have two kinds of markets. You have a seller's market where there's high demand and very little homes for sale. And then you have a buyer's market, you know, or maybe a, what we call a softening market where we're growing in terms of homes available. And maybe demand has become stifled a little bit. On the other side is condition. Well, you've got things that maybe are model home condition. And then you have for, you know, those that have deferred maybe maintenance, you know, on the other spectrum. And so when we think about where we price your home, these are the things to consider. Now you've probably been paying attention to the market given that you're thinking about a move and where do you think the trend is right now? Does it feel like uh, we're in an extreme seller's market where there's high, high demand and very little inventory? What, what's your, been your observation of the market? 
Now, if they're paying attention, they might say, well, I've been seeing signs stay up longer. And I'd say, well, you're right. It, it's a softening trend right now. So the trend line is moving in this direction. Now, it's not technically a buyer's market. We've got four months of inventory. Um, we don't start getting into maybe a balanced market until five months, six months, starting to move towards a, uh, a buyer's market, meaning it favors the buyer. And yet the trend is moving this way. And then when I say, say risk, when I say risk, what I'm really concerned about is if we miss price and the trend is moving this way, you know, are willing willing to risk maybe chasing a market that maybe is continuing to soften. Now, let's go to the condition side. You know, on the condition side, we said there's really two spectrums. There's like, okay, model home perfect, deferred maintenance on the other end. You know, I mean, if we were thinking this is a one, this is a 10, where would you put your home on the condition spectrum? And they say, eh, yeah, it's better than average. I mean, I'd say it's a seven. Okay, so so maybe in here somewhere, right? And then timing, let's talk timing. You know, so if, if, if we think in terms of when you want to be in Miami, um, it sounds like 90 days is you'd like to be sold, closed, and in 90 days, you know, in Miami, um, is that am I is that the, still the plan? Is to get you guys to Miami in ninety days? It is okay. Now, by the way, if we have all the time in the world, sometimes you know you can kind of lean higher, and as you said, give it a shot and see what happens. If you don't have a lot of time, you probably want to reach more towards the market price. Um, and yet, the other thing to consider in terms of timing is what's the trend? Because if the trend is pushing this way, let me ask you a question. If the, if the trend is pushing this way to a softening market, is time our friend? And they go, well, what do you mean? Well, if, if that trend continues, time could cause what to happen? Well, further decline in value or softening of the market. Right, I mean, we could miss your timeline if we, if we chase maybe a premium price at this point in the market. So would we agree that time is probably not our friend right now and that we want to find a price that gets you moved to Miami? And they go, well, yeah. So well, based upon the trend and based upon the fact that you really don't want to risk missing your timeline, conditions, good. I mean, you're, you should be competitive. And yet we, we looked at those you're competing against. Where does it feel like we need to be to be truly competitive and have you guys in Miami in 90 days? And more times than not, here's been my experience in a softening market. They will pick right in here. They might have wanted to reach for this, but after this discussion, They'll reach right in here. Some will even go a little below market because they want to get ahead of a trend. And I might even say now some sellers, they'll get a little bit ahead of this trend. And maybe they might do 295 and get a really assertive position. And here's what can happen. I'm not promising it'll happen in your case. They can create almost an auction-like atmosphere because they're right at market, they're seen as one of the best values in the, in the marketplace. And the possibility of multiple offers, even in a softening market, when we price it right at market or a little bit below, we can create possibly that auction-like atmosphere. And yet the other option is we can stay fairly firm if we have to. And I feel confident in your ability to stay firm if that's where we begin. Well, they say, Steve, well, you know, okay, well, well, you know, I get that, but, you know, we got enough time and I think we got enough flexibility. Can we go ahead and like, like put it at 315? Okay, well, we could. Let me share one last thing with you before we make that final answer, okay? You know, the, remember that millionaire show, final answer? You know, but before we get final answer, let me 
illustrate something for you. Do you know what this line is? And they'll say, actually, no. I said, well, so this line right here is future wholesale. If the trend continues, let's say we go into a recession or something like this, this could be future wholesale. And that means this could be what? Future market. And this 315, where we're thinking about pricing it, well, that might be future premium. And we're still caught at the top of the cycle. And the risk is in a, in a softening market. Now, I would probably use this if I were an extreme shift in my market. If I was really building inventory and it was really beginning to trend to a buyer's market, and we're starting to see a lot of price pressure. I would I would lay out this dotted line. And by the way, this the smart seller in this market probably goes to 290 or 295 and gets ahead of the trend. And that was the whole conversation. I would take it right back to so again, based upon this, where do you feel we need to be to get you to Miami? in 90 days. And I'm going to put up here so you'll have it in the recording just a, a little clearer, um, the slide deck. And Megan, let's go ahead and send these slides out with the recording to these folks. And so you can see, you know, here it is. And you've got, if you want to screenshot that, so you got a clearer view, you know, of the conversation. And again, my experience with a seller's market, they're going to pick somewhere in here because rarely are they going to have the time situation in their favor and the condition and the risk tolerance to go all the way to premium. And they'll generally hover closer to market. My experience in a buyer's market, especially an extreme buyer's market, is that the smart seller will actually go a little below market. You know, maybe this represents 290 to get ahead of the downswing. And then, of course, there was that illustration that I just gave you a moment ago um, in terms of uh, factors that would, would influence this. And so it's a really simple conversation, and I, I share that with you um, for the purposes of you are running into sellers that that maybe have an expectation um, about the market and where to price and what to do uh, that feels a little bit like a battle. And the truth is, when they uh, when they truly understand the dynamics of what influences, somebody has to go back a, 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 a dyna. I'm not sure which slide you're referring to, but I'll I'll put up this final one again so you've got this. Uh, it's it's actually Adina. Adina, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. No, the first one when the, was the everything, like was nothing filled out, the first one. I think yeah, it's two, two bags. Two. Yes, one more. Perfect. No, one more. Um, Ta-da! Okay, I think it was that was the first one, right? Okay. Hang on a second. I'm, I'm going, got to go on the right way. There you go. And by the way, okay. that's what you draw out in your legal pad right there. And, and so go. The right price in a softening market in one conversation. Now, if 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 here's the thing, I'm going to say: How many of y'all would like to have a really great holiday season? Say yes. I'm just pretending you said yes because you're muted. And the best path to to a, a great holiday right now is in the inventory you currently have. And it's in those price adjustment conversations that have to occur. And you can you can incorporate this into a price adjustment conversation. And what I would do, quite honestly, for a price reduction meeting, I would set a meeting to go sit down at their kitchen table. And I said, I'd, I'd call it a strategy meeting and say, guys, we seem to have stalled out in our activity. Um, there have been some shifts in the market. We're seeing a a softening trend. And I want to make sure we don't get caught behind a softening trend and not make the right decisions now that can get you to Miami. 
And so can we sit down and go do a complete market update? And I would go back and look at, you know, the most recent sales. Where were we a bridesmaid, not a bride? And maybe go through the pictures and say, here's what somebody said yes to. And then, by the way, here's what we're competing against today. And go through the pictures. And, and the, the other part of this is remember the competing market. It's any market that somebody that would say yes to their house might also yes say yes to a house in that market. As you're, you're having a more challenging marketplace, you've got to broaden the spectrum of what your competition is because you have fewer things going under contract, you're competing for fewer buyers, you got to make sure you're in the game and not on that out of the market spectrum. Um, the, the last thing I'll say on price adjustments is I would go to this and, and really the thing that's going to help you in the conversation is if there's been a trend shift. You know, if we've gone from a month of inventory to three months of inventory or one point, one and a half months of inventory to four months of inventory, or when there's a pronounced shift or movement in those statistics, which means you also have to be the person that's doing the research and, and you know those trends. Let's, let's focus on a couple of uh, questions you have real quick. So uh, thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, so, so what are some thoughts or questions? What did you hear? What can we give, give you clarity about? And then I have a couple of last thoughts for you. This is John Rimnack. Can you hear me okay? Got you, man. Hey, Steve. Uh, great job again. Truly amazing. And uh, coming from 72 sold, um, that's that's quite the compliment in my opinion anyway. Uh, but hmm. listen, the, the, the question here is competing market, um, excuse me, competing markets. So it's almost like you're saying go outside the subdivision if a buyer and i've known this i just don't do it it's really phenomenal if a buyer is going to shop there they're not just looking for that subdivision they're looking for other subdivisions it could be three miles away i generally go one to two miles i mean we're selling mm -hmm. 80 to 100 homes a year and then all of a sudden i look up and i'm like there are a lot of homes not selling did i get this wrong and then i went too mm -hmm. hard price reduction conversation. I lost the listing. Uh, I pissed them off. Uh, that's fine. That happens. That's besides the point. But if I had done the research better, I could have done this chart that you um, drew out. But um, can you elaborate a little bit on like competing markets? Like, is that five miles away, 10 miles away? Does it matter? I, I think it's more a matter of, of, it's generally a matter of price range, amenities, schools, what are the things that make a subdivision attractive? And then where, if and you think about what's your typical buyer searching in terms of a price range, maybe a, a $50,000, $70,000. If they're in the median price, if your median price is $400, they're probably looking three fifty dollars to four and a quarter. And that's their range. I'm like, okay, well, where else is there three fifty dollars four and a quarter with homes that are about you know, 10 years old or 15 years old, whatever that market kind of is. So it's going to have a similar style. Uh, and who's got equal schools, same schools or better schools. And that maybe is within that could be, could be as much as five or 10 miles. And, and yet it's going to be kind of tough justifying that as a comparable. And yet it is competition. And, and I think this becomes the thing and, if you've got the manpower to, or, you know, in terms of an assistant or virtual or somebody in getting feedback on showings and, you know, people that did buy, where else are they considering? This becomes important feedback moments to give to your client. So um, it, I don't think it's just a matter of radius. It's a matter of where would other people go to buy a house like this, comparable schools, comparable commute uh, to places people want to go.
That's huge. It's almost practically speaking, um, creating a, another saved CMA search, if you will, in my MLS system that says, okay, here's your area. Now let's go look at this competing market. I know that's eight miles away, but look at this. It's the same year. It's the same kind of thing, um, practically speaking. And yeah, I don't do a great job um, uh, calling for the other showings. And that's something I do have some assistance to help me with. So thank you again. You're welcome. Uh, Felicia, go ahead. And yeah, by the way, I'm going, you a, I'm going to give you a tip that'll have them calling you in just a second to get a price reduction. So hang on for that tip. Go ahead, Felicia. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and yes, I'll reiterate what others have said. This has been a uh, great training in just 30 minutes. So <laughs> really great. So my question is pertaining to a listing that I have that was an expired listing. Uh, I call expires and been on the market for several months. Um, I was able to get them to reduce the price and it's still sitting on the market. Now, the thing is, it is a newer home in an older community. So it doesn't mm -hmm. have the amenities of the newer communities that are nearby within probably a couple of mile radius. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out you know, how to better price it and make a different recommendation for my next conversation. Yeah, I think it's the same thing there, Felicia. I think you got to look and say, well, here are the other communities people might be considering. And and it requires the work to go sometimes, you know, okay, who looked at this was really kind of interested, but we lost out. Where did they buy? And, you know, what's going under contract right now? And say, this is the area that's attracting. And it looks like this is who we're competing with. We're not just competing with these older homes. We're also competing with amenities and schools. And sometimes when you are when you are a red dot and a sea of blue dots and you have something that's completely different, maybe it's an infill, um, you have to go look for some of those that are like that in some of these infill communities. Is there anything like that? Uh, and if not... Um, you know, it, it's a it's a little bit of a feeling your way, uh, yeah. and you really got to monitor feedback and where did people buy. Uh, that's not the easiest of, of situations, um, and yet I'm going to cause I'm going to encourage people to be really aggressive in their pricing and say let's let's get at that right at market maybe a little below and let's see if we can create an auction like atmosphere rather than risk reaching because there's not a whole lot here to justify whatever the reach is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a tough one. I mean, that's a tough one yeah, to navigate, <laughs> you know, because the, the, the things you're comparing against are not similar. They're much older. Um, and then, and yet go back and define Felicia, what really is the competing market? What am I competing against with this house? Mm -hmm. And is there anything that's like it? And maybe that's where I'm losing out. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay. And by the way, here, here's some language for you. If the, if, if we keep getting, you know, there's the old rule of thumbs. Let's go back to the old rule of thumbs. Maybe they're, they're, they're old rule of thumbs to me. May, they might be new rule of thumbs to you. The old rule of thumb was this. If, if you get, you know, a significant number of showings in the first two, three weeks, no offers, well, you're probably five, six percent overpriced. We're we're getting some showings, we're just not getting the offers. Now, if I go two, three, four weeks and I'm getting very few showings, the marketplace is saying not interested in your offering, and the showings we do get don't really result in anything. Um, and if we're not getting you know good volume through compared to maybe some of the other listings in our market, that might indicate to us we're as much as 10% uh, overpriced. And so, you know, the, if the market is continually saying no, it may be one of these things where, I, I, I'm gonna tell y'all a pet peeve. Y'all can put y'all can put in remarks of this pet peeve for you too. Um, you know, we follow real estate in Colorado. We have a t intendance, uh, intention to buy something in Colorado. And I, I'll, I saw a home the other day, a million two home that had a $9,000 price reduction. And I'm going, that's not a price reduction. That's a hallucination. I, I don't know what the hell they're smoking. 
you know, and then you'll you'll see ridiculous price reductions. Now, yes, I know it makes it show up in somebody's search in Zillow uh, that maybe has been following that area or had favorited that property. And yet it doesn't demonstrate that they're serious about changing their condition or their position in the market. And so in my mind, I want you all to think about price reduction started a minimum of 4%. A standard price reduction would be 4 to 6%. An aggressive price reduction would be 10%. Anything less, than, if, if, if price is the issue, you can't say it's condition because you can overcome condition, condition with price. You can't say it's the railroad tracks. You can, can, you can overcome railroad tracks with price. And anything less than 4% is a hallucination. That's the best word. That's the best word I can give you. It's a hallucination. You're you're not really serious about changing your position in the market. Uh, you're pretending to have done something to improve your situation. It's likely not going to do it. Um, let me go back one last thing. And um, whoops, hang on a second. Let me get back to share screen. I do want to share with you guys, if you would, would like to have these kind of conversation, market of the moment uh, conversations, you know, how to really uh, build that trust position with your database, um, I invite you all to, uh, let me get back to where we were, uh, to come explore our never ending referrals program. And um, uh, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, Tammy Youngst and I, we run a group coaching program called Never Ending Referrals. And we have eight core lessons that take you right through how do you become the master of your database or stated goals for you to get a 10% return on your database and grow it by 250 or more over the next 12 months. And of course, we've got expert interviews. We teach you all the gambits working for, with your database. <clears throat> Our next session is October 7th. And one of the things we do every round of beginning of the quarter, in case you don't know, I'm the guy that created that thing you love to hate called DTD2. And um, it came from our never ending referral system. And one of the things we do every quarter is we do the market of the moment update. We say, what are the conversations that you have with your database right now that helps you get to more kitchen tables? that helps them understand the, the crazy wackadoo real estate market and the opportunities of it so that they say yes to those opportunities versus being stuck in the confusion of the market. And so uh, our next session is October 7th. That's when we have that market of the moment update. And the following Monday, we begin again with session one of Never Ending Referrals. And if you'll just go to neverendingreferrals.com, and it'll take you, uh, you'll have a, you can go to the join me link. You can find out more. Uh, you can, you can go enroll in never ending referrals. And Megan, why don't you just drop that link in the chat. If you guys like to explore it, it's worth $39 a month to be part of our community. And we've got people who have been with us for three years because we have conversations like this. And we go through the market at the moment. And what are the trends? And what do I say to my database? How do I get them unstuck when they're on the fence right now? because of all the media noise. So uh, I'm gonna give you one last tip here. I'm gonna go back to my slides for a minute. And again, uh, we'd love to have you on Never Ending Referrals. Come find out more, join us. And uh, yet, let me go back to my slides for a minute. And I wanna give you just a couple of other thoughts um, as we go here. One of the things we've gotta bring sellers to in terms of understanding, especially in a market where it's softening is the less we negotiate, the more you make. Get the price right in the beginning. You know, have it appear to be that best value in the marketplace such that they're not going to want to get away. And understand that as inventory broadens, buyers know the market and they understand value when they see it. And you've got to position yourself to be the next one sold. Smart sellers sell quickly, better prices, um, with better prices. And Top agents, your job is to bring the negotiation skills to the table, and you're doing it right there when you demonstrate to them the factors that determine the market. Here's the other thing to help your sellers understand. If, if we don't have an offer in two weeks, we're probably overpriced, period. 
because, and here's even in a softening market, you say, I'd rather be more aggressively priced and create an auction like atmosphere rather than risk a softening, softening market and writing down maybe some softening in price, especially as we go into seasonality. Um, and especially as we go into seasonality in the winter. And then, of course, we already talked about standard versus aggressive price reductions. Let's see what we have question wise in here. Thanks, Marie. Appreciate that. Uh, the recordings uh, look able will be sent to you guys in an email. So, and it'll be posted on the MAPS Coaching YouTube channel. You'll be able to find that there. Uh, what was the question you asked to get agents to call you back? John, it might be one of those where you you, you call, hey, um, it's Steve over at Keller Williams. Hey, we had a really important question. And they'll call you back. So that might be it. That's, um, that's brilliant. <laughs> I would call it back. That, well, there you go, right? And it's um, it's just just, just it just may, that may be what it takes. You got to find gambits that get through the noise and get people to talk to you. Uh, actually, Megan says next session is actually September thirtieth. We're gonna call. We're gonna cover some uh, NAR. NAR is it N A R NAR? I think I get in trouble when I call it NAR. N A R conversations, lawsuit conversations, uh, on the thirtieth. So again, that links in the chat. Uh, what if you've already done one nice price cut and you are on the second? Jackie, that's a great question. And, and here's what I would say to that. Always take ownership. You know, the, Steve, if you go to make Steve, them wrong, you lose. You may want to start out. Yes. You may want to start over. You froze up. Oh, I froze up. Yeah. Like I said, we we're having some network issues. Um, so thanks. Uh, uh, so going back to, so Jackie's question was, what if you've already done one nice price cut and you're on the second? And always take ownership. And, and this is what that'll sound like. And you might say, guys, I want to share with you kind of some trends I'm observing in the market. And I think I was a little too optimistic when we had our last meeting about what I thought we could still ring out of the market. And yet the market is kind of speaking and I'm starting to see a bit of a pronounced trend inventories building. Um, we're seeing buyers be pickier. Can I walk you through what's happening a little bit? And then and let's go back and look at, you know, the competition that we're facing today. I mean, we looked a lot at recent solds and pendings. I think today we really have to take a really hard look at our competition. And I broadened the part of the market that I'm looking at because I'm finding that buyers right now, because they have more to choose from, they're really broadening their range of neighborhoods and areas that they're looking at. And, and we're competing with more than just lazy acres. Can I walk you through what I'm seeing? And I think if you just take this place, I think I was a little too optimistic. I know how important it is for you to get moved to Miami. And I want us to sit down and really figure this out so we don't miss getting you to Miami by blank. The key is you're working for their motivation every time. Take the whole getting the house sold and the price and keep the conversation on getting them to Miami, getting them to where they desire to be. That's the critical conversation. Um, yeah, let me I see have a here. question. Hi, it's Adina. <laughs> Steve. Yeah, Can go ahead. You... Hi. So actually, by the uh, way, there's, there's, hang on, I got to do one thing here. Maggie, put your hand up there somewhere. Where's Maggie? I'm right here. All right. You put, come on video. So we can see, are, you, are you on video? I can't see you. I am now. Okay. Raise your hand. So I can, so go down there and under, um, whatever that thing is you press to raise your hand. Hmm. I don't know. Oh, found it. Got it. There it is. There she is. All right. Now, by the way, I'm just going to tell you, if you got a Georgetown referral, Georgetown, Texas, <laughs> this is my daughter. 
and and she just got her real estate license. I'm going to do a shameless plug for her. If you've got a Georgetown, Texas, Round Rock, Texas referral, she's smart as a whip. She's motivated. She'll get it done. Ma Maggie, I had to do a shameless plug for you. So there you go. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> now, by the way, she, my, my, her mom is a Cobalt Banker, and she's a Cobalt Banker with her mom. We won't hold that against her at the moment. <laughs> She will be wearing red sometime soon. And then right beside her on the screen, my screen anyway, is Megan Denny. That's her sister. So there you go. I got I got girl power on here and love you guys. Thanks for being on. So see you, Maggie. All right. Um, so guys, let's go back. I'm sorry, that question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just had I had to do that shameless thing right there. It was me. Congratulations. It was your daughter, you said? <laughs> was it your daughter? Hey. This is my daughter, yes. <laughs> okay, so great. <laughs> yeah, that's really cute. Um, so um, no, I was just saying I have a similar issue as Felicia, I think. Uh um in my area, mm -hmm. the properties are look so different because they built in the 1970s and they have mm -hmm. their own unique charms. And so I'm just uh, wondering what are would be the factors in this case to price it right? Like, you know, should I look at I, I don't know what to really look at because they are really like unique. <laughs> it's it's well, and this is this is where the the pictures come in, right? So when you're going through that CMA and you're going through those actives, you you're establishing there's there's a reason somebody wants to be in a certain area. What's the area they desire to be in? And if the properties are all 1970s and there are different degrees of improvement. And let's say this one's at 500,000. And I'm, I'm going to take everything that's available in that competing market from about 400, you know, to 560. And I said, let's look at what, what's out there in terms of choices. You know, because I might even look up to 560 because there could be things that, you know, are so much more improved of, of for that era or vintage of house that, Somebody's going, I'm willing to pay more, you know, because there's more value there. And, and, and so I might actually broaden my price criteria. And then we're going to scroll through those pictures and we're going to um, say now, now, if you had to buy one of these right now, which one would you buy and why? What do you see as the best value? And you'll say to them, see, buyers shop just the way you do. They shop by comparison. And, you know, and, and so if one has more features, more amenities than yours and at similar price, well, if they were going to come to buy your home, what would they expect you to do? Well, they would expect you to lower the price. And, and so um, I would just really go back and use the photos. That's, that's your muscle when you have that kind of market. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me see if I've got anything else in the chat. Oh, what was your tip to get clients to call you for the price for that? Well, the clients to call you, um, we should be in touch with our clients at least once a week, every week. And so if we haven't established that cadence. Uh, that's a challenge. And what I would simply say is, hey, guys, I'm set aside some time for you on Saturday this week. I'd like to stop by and have a little strategy session. And I would just say I've set aside some time for you. Um, you know, when, when can it be better morning or after get off another place? Set the meeting. No, Steve, you, um, said all right, guys, uh, you were going to share a tip. I, I, I don't remember what that was. I think it was the, <laughs> um, oh, well, here's one. I've, I've thrown so many out here. Um, how do you explain the chasing the market down? Do y'all remember that toy that Hasbro had called a Slinky? Everybody remembers Slinky, right? And and think yeah. about a Slinky on a on a, on some stairs. And one of the way one of the ways I've explained this is like, okay, when we're thinking about a a softening market, and y'all remember that toy called a Slinky, and they'll say yes. And I said, well, imagine a Slinky going down the stairs, and if I want to stop the Slinky. And I read, and, and it's going down the stairs, and I'm following it. And I reach down from behind to grab the slinky. Where am I going to go? My momentum is my weight's going to carry me crashing down the stairs. 
if I really want to stop the slinky, what do I have to do? And they'll go, well, I guess you got to get in front of it. Exactly. And, and so what we don't want to do is, you know, keep chasing the slinky from behind and then wind up having a crash at the end. You know, the best move for us right now is to get ahead of the slinky, stop it, take advantage of, of everything we can wring out of this market, get the right price right now. And here's the mindset for you as an agent. One last tip. The mindset for you and agent, I go back to that 14-day mindset. Another way to, to think about that is asking yourself the question and, and being honest about it and saying, what price does this home need to be at to be the next one sold in its competing market? What's the price this home needs to be at to be the next one sold in its competing market? In a softening market, that's your price. Felicia, you get the last word. We're going to wrap it up. Real quick, what time on Mondays are the coaching sessions? Oh, thank you. Great question. They are at noon central time. One hour. Yeah. Perfect. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you for being here, guys. Today, I've, I've got to run on to another Zoom. And it's a pleasure to hang out with you. Uh, I trust you got a little something that will help you make some money this week with a price reduction conversation or... Go to that listing appointment and get the right price on it this week, and let's get it under contract in two weeks or less. See ya.